Well, thank you for coming. Don't, no, no applause yet. <laughs> I'm going to, thank you, Rick, because <laughs> I'm going to open this with a prayer. I found this. God, grant me the serenity to accept the owners I cannot train, courage to train the ones I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. <laughs> it's by an unknown poet. <laughs> I thought that was appropriate. Well, um, I thought I would, uh, because of the diversity in this show, I mean, we have so many um, stylistic approaches to expression and so many perceptions of our pets uh, that I thought we might look at sort of categories of expression. Uh, expressionism might be one. Classicism might be another. Naturalism, abstraction, um, even uh, sort of uh, philosophical abstraction, because we have it all here. <clears throat> and so we, if you look at uh, some of these stylistic categories, I've got some notes here I'm going to refer to. If we look at um, put my glasses on. Expressionism, is that person wanting to come in? Uh, looks like they may be lost. We might look at expressionism as a form of abstraction uh, because <clears throat> what it goes away from is anything that's naturalistic in appearance and maybe even naturalistic in content. Um, naturalism uh, May, have, may share some properties of expressionism, such as uh, brushwork, technically, uh, or color, or even context, or it may not. So it kind of depends on the, the painter's approach to that, con that, that subject and that topic. And what we have here is that diverse range of approaches. So for instance, I'm looking at uh, Maritz uh, two drawings of the poodles, and I'm immediately struck by a classical reference and an abstract reference. The abstraction comes from the coloration, black and white, white and black. And you'll notice that the two pair are reversed, so it's kind of a yin-yang idea, very abstract thinking. Um, and detailed in terms of reversing, positive and negative which one is positive, which one is negative, really isn't material here. That's unimportant. But uh, technically, we can see how she has treated the edges of each drawing in opposition to each other. The top <clears throat> goes from black to white, while the, the top on the right-hand side goes from black to a dark gray. That black, by the way, on the very bottom, is not really integral to the drawing, but it is something we see. So the drawing starts here with white and there with gray, dark gray, and reverses itself. And even along the bottom edges where the paper has been folded and touched in subtle ways, we find that reversal taking place there. This is very, I would call it intellectualized as opposed to emotional. And the whole idea of the poodle in that context is very intellectual. I mean, it's, it's a best of show kind of thinking. You know, it's the tailored dog, the perfect dog, or looking for the perfect dog. So in opposition to that, we might take something that is more expressive, and to do that, we might want to go into the other room, but we'll wait for a little bit, okay? So this is my thinking about this whole show. Um, expressionism as a style, Really, we can find many examples dating back probably about the 1800s, especially in France, in Germany, in Spain, with Goya, for instance, highly expressive, uh, Jericho in France. Um, and of course, into our modern time, which is we might call modern abstraction or modern expressionism, with uh, Lee Krasner, Jackson Pollock, Franz Klein, all of those heavies from the 50s. 
Naturalism, if we look at it as the opposite, can be more aligned with photography. And because the photograph or the camera tends to delineate the forms that we see as they are, as they appear. Expressionism takes advantage of the ability to change as things appear, as they have happened. We can look at three different scenes, experience three different events, and we can put them all together in one form, which takes it away from a naturalistic content. We might look at um, simple examples of uh, naturalism, of course, as the Impressionists of the early, uh, late 19th century, the 1850s, and Monet, and Renoir, and Sicily, and all of those. Now, there's another sideline to the naturalist con component, and that is a romanticized view, where things are seem to make, be made better than what they appeared to us. Uh, and we have some wonderful examples in here of that, uh, even though they might be based on a photographic kind of property. Um, <clears throat> so we can find that the form is very natural, but the context of it isn't, so it takes it into another realm. Uh, around the wall here is the large painting with the three, what do you call them, superheroes? The dogs in the superhero costumes? Well, that's a fantasy, of course. But it's a good fantasy, it's a romanticized idea that has been shifted over to dogs. <laughs> of course, we have hero dogs. We had some here the other night. We had two Dalmatians that were uh, therapy dogs. They're kind of heroes for what they do. Classicism, which is what I pointed to there, is you know something that dates back to Ancient Greece, uh, probably uh, Mayans, um, <clears throat> where forms are made in their ideal contour, put it that way. Um, classicism as we know it in painting kind of came about in about the 19th century in France, especially in France, and it was politically oriented. We don't have so much political orientation here but we do have a lot of classical thinking. And that's one of them. And another one is the three panels with the blue on top. We have to look at that. But it, again, it's kind of an intellectual purifying process. And the, the characteristics of classicism are harmony and proportion and balance and precision. And we can see all of that there. The balance, the harmony of the two pieces, If you want to find a painter that was a really good French painter, Rosa Bonheur, B-O-N-H-E-U-R. Painted horses, cows, beautiful, big paintings. One of the most famous female artists of the 19th century. One of the best. Okay, so, abstraction, blah, blah, blah. Then there is one, one style that represented here that is not throughout the show, but is ancient in its orientation. And that is the calligraphy drawings of cats. The ancient art of calligraphy dating back to about 900, I think it was, in, in China, um, sought to find what we might consider a classical orientation, because it sought to find a pure principle found in nature. And it, but it was more oriented to not an intellectual expression as so much as an emotional expression about feeling. And we can sense that in these wonderful little drawings. Where'd they go? Here, I'm standing in front of them, right here. But there's also a sort of severe quality about them that drives me to thinking classical because it's so restrained. And restraint is, again, the opposite of expressionism, Western expressionism. So we might look at works that have restraint, that have proportion, harmony, beauty. Those things all add up to beauty. And we might look at works that have 
expressive properties of distortion, exaggeration, um, even uh, arbitration or arbitrary properties. Color, for instance, around the corner there's a painting of two dogs, a yellow dog and a black dog, I think. We'll look at that. Do you have some thoughts about what I'm just saying here? Some questions you might want to raise? Well, the Sumi painting here, with the, mm -hmm. it's, it's like a, she began with the um, Enso, which is a, this circle. Yes, yeah, circle. Which right, is, which is wholeness, right? Wholeness. The prin a principle underlying nature. Is, right. Right. That's, that's what strikes me when I look. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I, th I think it, you know, it's, it dates back to not literally, but dates back philosophically to 900 years. Mm -hmm. Well, 900, year of 900. Yeah. Okay. So let's uh, walk in here and pick up ourselves and grab a donut. This work by uh, Sherry Hanafi, homage to Shraddha, Shraddha, kitty girl. It's about her personal um, connection uh, with this cat, and it's about the cat's dying. It's a three-piece work, which makes it more conceptual than visual. So one has to look at it in terms of a concept about art, not just strictly a concept about cats. Uh, <clears throat> so we have three abstract elements going on. They're very orderly. The proportions of each of these rectangles is just about the same, all three. Yeah. And it goes from a very complex written statement to a visual statement to another visual statement. Yeah. So it's primarily visual, falls into a classical kind of thinking process, and very conceptual. Not so much emotional. If we look at the yellow dog and the black dog on the red ground, red and purple ground in the back wall, we can see that not so much a concept as a direct image making. And color is chosen arbitrarily, not so much necessarily about the dogs, but about the perception of the dogs by the painter. Yeah, so what we see is her inner vision, or his inner vision. I can't remember who did that. Her? her? Yeah. So we see an inner vision there. And it's color for its sort of its own sake, for its own emotional content, as opposed to color for descriptive content, or color for symbolic contact. So color used in three different ways. So how do you find <clears throat> your response to the two works are right next to it, right behind you. The paintings, uh, the images are rough, crude, forceful, heavy, dense. I mean, I don't know what other adjectives you would use, but those are some of the ones I use dark. when I see them. Hmm? Dark. Dark, very dark, yeah. They're not, not bright in coloration like the one on the left, but there's a kind of thickness to it, kind of density about the involvement of the artist. And we can relate them to painters from the past, like Marc Chagall on the bottom, the floating figure, the dark black outlines of colors. We can relate it to probably coloring color books when we were little children. You know, put in arbitrary colors and surround them with those big black lines. Uh, which seems to be kind of an instinctive process of making an image. Or maybe it's a cultural process. When we look at uh, the large painting on the wall with the, the cat to the right, uh, <clears throat> on the back wall, you see this is a prize winner, right? Yeah. First prize. And this was by? Um, I can't remember her. Rose name. Nichols. Rose Nichols. Yeah. Okay? So we don't have, we have more of a naturalistic effect as opposed to the 
abstract expressionist effect over there, but it's not photographic. And photography and naturalism kind of align with each other. You know. But this is very selective, very simplified. We see very sense of the texture of the floor, for instance. We see a texture and a color, but it isn't about the floor. Now we do see the texture of the cat and the coloration of the cat, but even that is not quite to the realism of photography. Even that we don't have the sense of touch. So, so the orientation of this work to me is like the orientation of the two poodles. Kind of stand back, uh, a little bit uh, cool in, in, in involvement, very restrained. I mean, we have what, four colors, basically? Yeah, a whole painting with four colors. How many painting, how many colors in that lower one of the expressionists? You know, <laughs> almost every color in the color book, right? <laughs> or in the crayon box. Yeah, so um, they have a very similar quality in this uh, painting of a cat to Denise's painting, which I find a very wonderful painting, uh, of this cat. But there's an effect in here that's very naturalistic. And you really see it from a slight distance. I see it that way anyway. And that is that it's as if this is a screen. There's a screen you're looking through as opposed to a window, a clear window. And it's that little shift of color that she's created. And then there's the restraint of color. You know, the limited kind of information. Very beautifully organized, balanced. Things are in harmony, unified, just like this. So naturalism, if we look at naturalism, closer to abstraction. Naturalism, well, I guess we take something more like the drawing of the dog. Sky Gazing by Melanie Johnson, which looks like a photograph that has been printed with a dot screen of some kind. Uh, nothing, the only thing that isn't naturalistic, the color, the texture, and the background. Gee, three important parts. <laughs> and yet it looks real, looks natural. Yeah. Things don't fit in categories all that well sometimes. Naturalism, the photograph, gives us all this information. Precise statement about what's happening. It's a wonderful dog. Looks like he's in a donut. Very romanticized quality. You know, it's like, oh, I love this thing. My drawing of, of uh, Bo. Standing up saying, rub my belly is a romanticized statement. Yeah. I gave him a halo because he's so romantic. Because he has the perfect dog. Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> he knows how to stand up and get me to rub his belly. It goes back to that <laughs> prayer. <laughs> he trained me very well. Yeah. Um, we have some other pieces I was going to bring up. I haven't really talked to anything about the, the sculptural pieces. Here's one that I think combines a combination of fantasy and uh, fantasy, by the way, is, is a form of inner expression. It's purely your imagination. It's getting that out. But it also has some very classical and naturalistic properties. The naturalism, of course, is the configuration of the cats, and then <coughs> Uh, the classicalness of it is the orderliness of all this. Everything is very neat and clear and orderly and balanced. And I mean, this thing even works, <laughs> you know? And they had it so you could turn it, but I think they, they locked it. Oh, they, they glued the cat to it, that was it. Yeah. <laughs> Good use of materials. Something that more like what the paintings we have here are these very aggressive, assertive, raku clay cats that have colorations and configurations that are downright scary. 
<laughs> if you ever met one in the night, you have. The one, <laughs> Melinda has, Melinda has, well, she met it with a frog, but <laughs> she has a cat that's mad at her, angry, is yeah. how she calls it. I'd love to see something that she does to paint that, to express that. Maybe that's what I'll do for the faculty show. There you go. <laughs> my cat peeing in my shoes. <laughs> and the anger that's the behind anger that. that behind <laughs> my cat peeing in my shoes. Red pee or something. <laughs> or, I don't know, red cat, maybe. I don't know, me glaring over the back of the cat. <laughs> yes. So, yeah. And... You know, expressing something in this manner with that kind of emotion just doesn't tie together very well. It's, how do you bring that about? Well, that's one of the things that all these artists have been able to do, is they bring about in their organization of color, their, not just the imagery, but how they've organized it and what they've chosen not to include. You know, like what's, what's missing in this scene, or even in this one, you know that brings about a certain statement about their inner imagery. So. Um, I'll just mention a couple things about my paintings. This one is very hard to see because it really needs to be tipped out. There is a dog there, a <laughs> dog image. This was painting, painted uh, quite, a few years based, uh, quite a few years ago based on my experiences in Chicago. And it came to me one day, you're in this anonymous city. It doesn't matter where you live or how long you live there. It's just a background, right? So um, I didn't want the city to become important. But what was important for me was when you walk down the street and you turn a corner, you never know what's going to be around that corner. And it could be something good or it could be something bad. It could be something beautiful or not beautiful. You know? So that it's called encounter, and it's just about this dog, this person, and that person meeting on a corner in some configuration. This dog was based on a dog we owned. Uh, she was an English setter, no, English Spaniel. Springer Spaniel, Springer Spaniel, that's what she was, yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't work from photographs, by the way, I only work from memory. So the painting of her was just something I had seen her do at some point in my life. So, and <clears throat> this is an etching that I did quite a few years ago that um, was about <clears throat> the mystery of my heritage. <laughs> I knew some of it, and I knew um, immediate family members, but before 1800s, I didn't know anything, and I still don't. It's all a mystery, but it occurred to me, well, they're just people going through their life and they're doing different things. Just like the cats, there's two cats in here, and a dog, and that's Freckles, by the way, it's the same dog as there, uh, lay around and do their lively cat-dog things while people just move around and do their lively people things. You work, uh, you create fantasies, you stop and whatever you do, you sit and read, and fall asleep, whatever. So it's meant to be a kind of naturalistic content, but it's totally abstract. And it's express expressionistic. And this is a fantasy. Um, I did a painting in, his, in my studio of a still life and um, didn't finish the still life, left part of it there. And it occurred to me, you know, if we had mice, they'd go eat that. We don't have mice, but so they're in there somewhere. And there's a cat in there. Hard to see, though. Um, OK, I'm kind of running out of words here. So do you have some other questions or thoughts? Certainly try to answer any question you have. Technical question, aesthetic question. This one? Yeah. Would I talk about it? Yeah, would you? It's a love. <laughs> Alan, I like Alan. He's a good painter. He's very expressive. And uh, he's from France. He's, um, 
the coloration, the disembodiment of the head. I mean, really redu reducing. What isn't there is what you have to ask yourself in addition to what is there. You don't have to ask why so much, like why the lips on the cheek? Well, why not? The dog licks you all the time, right? Your dog, my dog does. So lick him back. <laughs> um, the crazy simple form of the dog, the eyes, we don't have any trouble recognizing what is what. Nose, teeth, I mean they don't look dog-like necessarily, but they don't look undog-like either. So they're sort of in between. And color is arbitrary. So it's about, um, it's, it's kind of like poetry in that the words don't necessarily describe an event, but they express the event in, what's the words, metaphors? Yeah, it's a visual metaphor. He loves his dog, his dog loves him. <laughs> he doesn't like his butt, but. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he doesn't like to bathe him. I don't know. <laughs> and dogs, but they don't really smile like that. I mean, it's a... No, don't. Although my dog, <laughs> Molly, Molly will look at me at times and I swear there's a smile there. And there are times when there's a demand, but you can't see it in her mouth. It's only in her eyes. It's like she will come to me and sit and stare holes through me until I do what she wants me to do, which is usually go get her a carrot, uh, let her outside. Well, of course, when she wants outside, she'll come and hit me. So that's a different form of communication. So, you know, and it's, I know it's subjective as can be, big deal. <laughs> as long as we know what we think they want us to know, we're fine. They're training us perfectly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. Any other questions about anything else? Any other pieces? In that painting, is it like male and female too? Which one? Oh, the dog. This one? Yeah. Well, you know that division, maybe. Yeah. Certainly the lips suggest female. And the Lipstick. Of the other side. Right, yeah. If you put your hand over it, it's, mm -hmm. yeah, it's quite different. You look at the left side versus the right side, you know, the eyelash thing. A, a naughty dog on the right and then... Ah. Yeah. Yeah. Well, see, now, this is the other aspect to expressionist painting. It raises your imagination and allows you to read things in your own terms. This is the whole idea of abstraction not to tell you how to think about something, but for you to decide how to think about it, or you do, you form how to think about it. Yeah. Yeah, I like that thought. That's pretty neat. A white dog and a green dog. <laughs> this is obviously not about a kind of dog. Again, you have to ask, what's not there? Yeah. So what's missing here in the painting of the dancers? Musicians. Hmm? Musicians. I mean. There may not be anything missing no. for the painter, no. but for our image of dancing in the dogs. Where are the dogs in that context? Why not? Do dogs dance? In their own sort of way they do. This is like Bo sitting up wanting his belly scrubbed. That's a kind of dance and he, he used to do this with me when he'd sit up, boxing kind of thing. And then I, if I boxed back at him, he'd bite me, he'd grab my hand. He wouldn't bite, he'd grab my hand. And this guy obviously is interested in something there, either this or this or we have a cat climbing up the curtain. I have a poem about that. Oh, I wish I could remember it. It's too long. Yeah, I'll bring it in. I'll post it somewhere. This is an <clears throat> interesting image in that it's, again, like the, kind of like the poodles, opposite sides, 
but entirely different from the poodles in how it's expressed and what it says, you know, color-wise, drawing-wise. There's very little restraint here. You know, um, and <clears throat> like C.J. said, as the painter of this, she said, thank God for the copy machine. <laughs> That's what she did. She just copied those images. She said it needed something in the corners, which shows a concern for balance. So there's, you know, there could be another reason for it being there, not necessarily something about what things mean. Yeah. Okay. This has a nice lazy flop feeling to it. It's like you know. that seems more naturalistic to me, even though the drawing is not, and the color is not. But the expression seems, well, that's how a dog lays, you know, when they're really that's how Lola lays sometimes. Yeah. yeah. I'm not gonna get up and look and see what I hear. I'm just gonna lay here and watch it and wait for a minute. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. Anything else? I'm done. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.